infectious diseases, research, medicine, health. Welcome to Outbreak News Interviews. And now, broadcasting from the Outbreak News Skylar Studios in beautiful West Central Florida, here is your host, microbiologist and editor of OutbreakNewsToday.com, Robert Harriman. Well, hey, everybody, this is Robert, and welcome to Outbreak News Interviews. Now, we've seen recent news reports of increases of leptospirosis cases in countries like the Philippines and India due to recent storms and the subsequent flooding. To take a look at this spirochete bacterial infection, I am joined by infectious disease physician Stephen LaRosa, MD. Dr. LaRosa, welcome back to the show, sir. Thanks very much, Robert. Okay, so what is leptospirosis and what is this uh, bacterial agent? Yeah, it's actually a, a cool looking organism. It's a spirochete, which means it has this corkscrew uh, appearance, uh, similar to other members you might think of would be syphilis and Lyme disease. It's a aerobe. Um, and uh, it's a, there are a number of pathogenic species which we'll probably talk about, but it would be, a, it would be an aerobic spirochete. Okay. Now, I, I really had no idea the answer to this question, but are there different strains of leptospira, the uh, genera for this organism? And the reason I ask you, because I saw a media report from India that quoted an official there who said, quote, we are seeing a virulent form of leptospirosis within just three to four days. We see the conditions of the patients going from bad to worse, close quote. Are there different strains? There, there are. Um, there are at least 22 species, and then there are multiple different um, uh, zero, zero groups of serovars, mm -hmm. and uh, not all of them are pathogenic, but the 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 species that tend to be the most pathogenic are leptospirosis, uh, leptospira interrogans, uh, and there's also a Boag petersenia. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but interrogans tends to be the one that's associated with the outbreaks, and of those, the zero group. Ictor, Ictor hemorrhagia seems mm -hmm. to be the zero group, and I don't know in this particular um, outbreak, but I suspect it's leptospira interrogans. Yeah. Um, okay, so now we know this is organism is found in the Philippines and India. Where else is it found geographically? It's really found anywhere where there's contaminated uh, water, and it can be runoff from uh, animal farms. Um, it can be as a result of flooding and the setting of storms. It, what you have to have is the organism being shed into contaminated water uh, by a species that harbors it, and that includes uh, probably most notably rodents, uh, cattle, uh, swine, uh, dogs, sheep, goats, they're, they pass this in their urine. Sometimes the animals are ill, sometimes they're not. Um, but it's just contaminated uh, uh, bodies of water, uh, usually. And then in terms of um, uh, swimming, it's fresh water. It's not, it's not sea water, so it's one of those fresh water organisms. But you'll, you'll see it in, in, in natural disasters, for instance, uh, where there's a lot of flooding. Right. Now, how common is this in the U.S.? It's it's not it's it's seen in the U.S. usually in more uh, in warm climates. The the state where it's actually uh, most noted, uh, most common is Hawaii actually, um, and it's usually associated with uh, uh, kind of adventure uh, adventure sports, kayaking, etc. So it's usually some kind of recreational. A sport where you've been exposed to the organism, which is in contaminated water, either via the the mouth or the mucous membranes or the conjunctiva, but also through cuts and abrasions. Right. That doesn't appear to penetrate intact skin. Right. Um, and you're up in Massachusetts. Do you do you see this on a regular basis? So I have uh, taken care of a handful of people with leptospirosis, some severe. Uh, it can give you some interesting anecdotes. A lot of times it's the travel history that's the key. I had a, a woman in ARDS who climbed the Duns River Falls in Ocho Rios 
in Jamaica, which is a fresh water and people cut, fall down and they slip and they cut and scrape themselves. And that was there. Uh, that was uh, what was notable there. But I also had a, a very uh, interesting story of a woman who was in the ICU uh, who was jaundiced and in renal failure. And uh, the key history there was she had a garden, a vegetable garden in Rhode Island, and it wasn't doing well. And I asked why and uh, got the answer, which was that the rats were eating everything in the garden. There and she go. didn't have the heart to do anything to get rid of the rats. <laughs> okay. And that um, was her exposure. So you can see it both. Uh, I, we can see it here, but uh, the travel history is probably the key in sure. this uh, in this setting. Right. And uh, um you kind of touched on this already. You know, how, how do people contract this disease, and who's most at risk? Uh, most at risk are the adventuresome. So this is not people, not couch potatoes. These are people who are out there, and they're they're either swimming uh, in in fresh water that's been contaminated. Uh, with animal urine and it can get into the mucous membranes in the mouth and the conjunctiva, or they're doing some kind of adventure sport that's associated with water where they're getting uh, cuts and abrasions uh, or an aerosolized uh, 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 infected um, uh, fluid. Now, um, uh, Dr. LaRosa, I'd like to spend some time discussing the symptoms and the clinical presentation of leptospirosis. Yes, yeah, so early on, it's a, it's a, it's very protean in its manifestations. It's, it, it's, there's nothing specific. Uh, patients will have fevers, myalgias, headaches. It will look like a flu-like illness uh, early on, or it can even, uh, what's often in the differential diagnosis is a rickettsial illness. It has that kind of flavor to it. If you get lucky, there's a very uh, telling clinical pearl um, that you don't see in other diseases called conjunctival suffusion. And it's just these beet red uh, conjunctiva. Uh, that is a kind of pathognomonic of the illness. You don't see it in all the patients, but if you see it, you know, you know what you're dealing with. Uh, patients can get cough, nausea, diarrhea. They can get an aseptic meningitis. Um, it's a, so it's a systemic illness in terms of its symptoms, but short of the conjunctival suffusion, there's nothing else that uh, makes you, just from a physical exam standpoint, um, uh, say that it, it's different, definitely leptospirosis. Right, and, and this can be a fatal disease. Yeah, it, it can be, and, and when it is fatal, it's usually fatal because of one or two reasons. It's usually um, uh, acute respiratory distress uh, syndrome, ARDS, and ventilator, and someone dies a death of a hypoxic a respiratory failure, uh, and also um, renal renal failure. Uh, it does attack the endothelial lining of blood vessels, so you can get uh, endothelial injury and third spacing of, of fluid, and that can be another problem. And then uh, the classic is Wiles disease, which is a, a severe form where you get uh, both hepatic and renal uh, dysfunction. Mm -hmm. um, now, how about the diagnostics that are available? Um, as an infectious disease physician, what test do you order? Yeah, so here's uh, here's something. It all depends in the in the setting of the illness. So I'd say most use, uh, most commonly, the way the diagnosis is made is with uh, a serology. Um, and it's usually having a, it's a microscopic agglutination test and an AT test, and you either uh, like typical serologies, you want to see a fourfold increase in the antibody levels over time, or you can have a single titer of greater than one to eight hundred is considered uh, diagnostic. There are some uh, uh, you can diagnose by PCR, but it depends on the stage of the illness, PCR and culture. In the first 10 days, you can isolate the organism in blood. Uh, you can also isolate it in the CSF if you do a lumbar puncture. Uh, as the illness goes on, the best bang for your buck is getting a urine culture. Now, you have to tell the lab that you're looking for because it's, uh, it's not something they'll typically pick up on microbiologic assays. So early on, blood and CSF, if you're going to try to culture a PCR, and later on, urine, and then serologies, I would say, is the way I've seen the diagnosis made most often. Um, how do you treat it? So there are a number of, of drugs that you can use. Um, 
Typically, uh, I would say people use doxycycline, and, and the reason is usually to hedge their bets because you're not quite sure early on if it's a, a rickettsial illness or, or leptospirosis, and, and doxycycline and tetracycline treat both. Um, but doxycycline, penicillin G actually uh, works quite well, and that's typically what's used in hospitalized patients, 1.5 million units Q6 hours. Ceftriaxone is also um, uh, very active. I think those would be the three main there's, uh, agents. There's, there's nothing to suggest that one uh, agent is superior to another. Uh, do you see treatment failures? Uh, you know, it's it's interesting. Uh, failures, I would say no, where you're still isolating an organism, but you certainly have people who have profound you know, organ dysfunction. It can take the uh, pe people who develop jaundice and renal failure or respiratory failure. It can take days of supportive care uh, mm -hmm. for those to resolve. So, uh, but, but the, again, but the those are end organ, right? But, but not antibiotic. antibiotic failure, right? Good. Um, and uh, what about prevention? Um, what, what do you recommend for people that are, are venturous, and, um, and is there a vaccine available for prevention? Yes, yeah, so there's no um, – so for prevention, it's to avoid uh, stagnant water and, and runoff water from animal farms. That's really uh, – or if you're in the setting of a, uh, you know, a natural emergency, uh, there is prophylaxis that can be done where if you're, for instance, a, a relief worker, uh, you know, uh, providing aid to people in a flood, uh, flooded area, you can take doxycycline 200 milligrams once a week uh, while you're working and then for two to three weeks after the end of the exposure. So you can do doxycycline prophylaxis. Rodent control is, is key uh, in, in this. Uh, it's predominantly the rodent uh, urine that's harboring the organism. And in terms of uh, vaccines, there's certainly uh, there's no human vaccine, but there's certainly vaccines that are given uh, to to pigs and pig farms, and also uh, to dogs. Um, uh, so there is some uh, uh, attempts to contain the animal um, uh, the animal population that gets the uh, the, the organism. Um, do you know of any human vaccine in the pipeline? I'm not aware of any in development, um, as as far as I know. Okay, and, and Dr. Larosa, any final thoughts on leptospirosis? Yeah, the uh, there is a, a, a key pearl, another pearl that we didn't talk about, and that's um, when you're looking at the labs. There's some, uh, there aren't many illnesses, infectious disease illnesses, that will give you a big disparity between the bilirubin and the transaminases, the AST and ALT. And this is one of those illnesses where the bilirubin will be uh, elevated out of proportion to what you're seeing with the transaminases. That's a key. Uh, you get CPK elevations in these patients, and they get thrombocytopenic as well uh, because um, uh, of the endothelial damage. And they'll have sterile pyuria. So oftentimes, when somebody comes in ill, they'll, somebody will want to blame the illness on a uh, on a UTI, but this is one of those causes of sterile pyuria. So it's not just TB that causes sterile pyuria. Think leptospirosis as well. Very good. Well, I want to thank you, Dr. Stephen LaRosa, for your time and expertise once again, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much.